Joining us now, Daniel Levitin. He is professor of psychology and behavioral neuroscience at McGill University, and he comes to us tonight from New York, New York. Daniel, how are you tonight, and how's life in Times Square where you are this evening? Things are great here, Steve. It's all Christmas and Hanukkah spirit and lots of bustling around and shopping and there's nothing like New York at this time of year. Ain't that the truth? Well, I wanted to have you on the program when I saw you, I guess it was about a month ago, uh, doing a most interesting um, performance by the Kitchener-Waterloo Symphony and you were lecturing at the same time all about how music affects the brain and given that this is Music Week at TVO, you're the perfect person to have on. And I want to start with just a little bit of background here. You've, you've no doubt heard it said that Mary Hart from Entertainment Tonight has her legs insured because they are so special. And I wonder whether or not people in the music business feel the same way about your ears because you, I'm told, possess a very special auditory skill. What is that skill? Uh, I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not sure what you're uh, referring to. Well, let um, me go on then. Let me go on because you've consulted to Stevie Wonder and Steely Dan and the Carpenters and, you, and the music for the movie Goodwill Hunting. The well, producers true, yeah. obviously see something in you that you hear that is different from the average bear. What is it that you bring to that? Well, okay. So, I, I, by the way, I haven't insured my ears, uh, <laughs> but maybe I should. Uh, I guess just I don't think of it as that special. There's a lot of people in the music industry and, in fact, in the broadcast industry who develop special talents or skills just as part of their job. I mean, I imagine if you were to ask your cameraman uh, about how many watts of light there were in the studio with you or what kind of colors are being reflected, he could give you a very erudite, he or she could give you a very erudite and technical description and is seeing things differently, uh, seeing hues in your, in your uh, clothing that, and in the backgrounds that the rest of us don't see. And I happen to have had the very fortunate experience of working in a top quality recording studio when I was younger and I learned to be able to tell the difference between one microphone and another just by the sound or one brand of tape from another back in the old days when we used tape. And, uh, and so often friends of mine or, or uh, people will hire me, uh, colleagues, to listen to something uh, and listen for the balance, whether things are really in place, whether the equalization and the spatial dimensions of, uh, of a recording are right. And it's, uh, I don't think of it as that extraordinary, but I, I sure enjoy doing it. Okay, Let, let's just, uh, again, by way of background, remind everybody, you're originally from San Francisco, and before you got into yeah. this, you know, cognitive study and psychology and all that business, you, you, you want to be a rock and roller, right? I did. I, I wanted to be a rock guitar player, and I joined a, a succession of bands in the early 80s as the lead guitar player. Uh, each one of the bands, I, I'd say we kept collapsing under the weight of our own incompetence. Uh, but eventually, after having clawed my way up to the bottom of the California music scene, uh, when the last band broke up, I decided to spend more of my time in the studio and less of it on the stage. And I, I loved being in the studio. I loved manipulating sound, and I really saw it as, as experimentation. Not that different from what I do in the laboratory today playing around with sound, with different musicians, different parts, mixing things in different ways to ultimately to yield a kind of emotional reaction in the part of the listener, somehow to combine these sounds as a painter would paint in order to make you feel something. Hmm. And as I say, in your 30s, you decide to go back to school and study cognitive psychology and cognitive science, and the result of which um, was a groundbreaking book. I'm going to let people know about it. It's called This Is Your Brain on Music. You published it four years ago. It spent a year on the New York Times bestseller list, translated into 18 languages. And in this book, you tell us why we are hardwired in the brain to love music. So let's dive into this. How do you know that? Well, there's a lot of different sources of evidence for this. One is we look inside people's brains. I mean, not literally, but we have technology now. You've seen these colorful pictures in magazines and newspapers. Brain scanning technology. Uh, we can essentially track the flow of blood in a person's brain to understand which neurons are active when people are engaged in different tasks, different thoughts or different activities, mental activities. So I can put you in a scanner and I can ask you to mentally practice your tennis serve or to perform math calculations or listen to music. And we can see which parts of your brain are active, whether they're similar to other parts or others. And the emerging evidence is that there's this huge network of areas in the brain 
crossing the entire brain from the front to the back, both halves, not just the, the right hemisphere, but also the left, that is activated by music. And some of the deepest, I'd say deepest and darkest parts of the brain in the limbic system, regions of the brain we have in common with all mammals and indeed with vertebrates, are activated by music, which suggests that music has an ancient evolutionary origin and that it, it really is part of the wiring of the human brain. If it has an ancient evolutionary origin, do we have any idea what the first ever song humans sang was? It's, you know, it's an interesting question and I think it's fascinating to contemplate that uh, the thing that di differs between, say, early song and early visual art is that visual art, cave paintings in particular, or, or clay pots and things, they're artifactual. They leave some sort of a trace for historians and archaeologists to uncover. Music being auditory and, and just being sound waves, it's ephemeral. It doesn't leave that kind of mark on, a, on the inside of a cave for us to really know. Mm. And we've only had recording for about 120 years. So the closest thing we can do is make inferences. And you ask an intriguing question, uh, what was the first song? Well, one source of information we have is a bone flute that was carved by hominid ancestors maybe 50 or 60,000 years ago at the dawn of Homo sapiens. And we can now play this flute and hear the scale that our early ancestors were using. We don't know how they used it or what sequence of notes, but the notes that they used sound surprisingly similar to our own major pentatonic scale, that is the the roots of blues music that we hear today. Hmm. All right, I talked about This Is Your Brain on music, and then you followed that up with The World in Six Songs. And again, by way of background, I'm going to read something about that book about which you said this. Music, I argue, is not simply a distraction or a pastime, but a core element of our identity as a species, an activity that paved the way for more complex behaviors such as language, large-scale cooperative undertakings, and the passing down of important information from one generation to the next. This book explains how I came to the, some might say, radical notion that there are basically six kinds of songs that do all of this. They are songs of friendship, joy, comfort, knowledge, religion, and love. Let's follow up on that, Daniel. What do you mean, basically, six kind of songs? Well, the idea here is that, uh, as you were asking, as we probe the evolutionary origins of music, how might our ancestors have used music? Uh, not just the first song, but the first playlist. What were the first songs that our ancestors were singing, and why were they doing it? Uh, and from the available evidence from archaeology and anthropology, the study of contemporary hunter-gatherer civilizations, and the study of, of music that's been collected in uh, all the quarters of the earth, the emerging picture is that we use music for a variety of communicative functions, one of them, it's maybe easiest to think about, is knowledge, the transmission of knowledge. So let's say humans have been around for 50 to 100,000 years. Well, we know we've only had written language for 5,000 of those years. Of course, our ancestors still had to remember things. They had very important things to remember, like which plants were poisonous, or how to get to the well, uh, how to dig a well, uh, how to lash together logs to make a, a, or an airtight water raft, things like that. Uh, and it, it seems as though our ancestors had discovered that music is a good way to embed this knowledge. So one of those six kinds of songs you mentioned were knowledge songs. When you look at hunter-gatherers, a lot of their music is about procedural things, how to make a basket, how to cook plants, how to dress a wound so that it doesn't become infected or irritated. Our ancestors discovered that music uniquely, better than language, is able to encapsulate and code important information. The mutually reinforcing cues of melody and rhythm and accent structure and rhyming, if there is that, helps to constrain the possible words that'll fit. It's easy to remember things when they're set to music. So let's follow up on another one of those angles. Joy. Joy is one of your six kinds of songs. And to that end, if you're blue, this is sort of what's going on inside the brain kind of a question. If you're in a blue mood and you want to feel better and you put on a song that you know in the past has made you happy, what's physiologically going on in the brain that would take you from a dark place to a happy place because you've heard a certain series of notes? Well, if you'll let me, let's break the question into two parts. Sure. 
So let's see what happens in the brain when you get cheered up without music, and let's bring music in as the second part. So in general, our brain is uh, swimming in this kind of neurochemical soup or neurochemical cocktail with a bunch of different hormones and neurotransmitters that help to regulate our daily function. They tell us when to sleep and when to, to wake up. We might use certain things to help uh, juice the system, right? Coffee in the morning or alcohol at night. All of these things are modulating levels of chemicals in the brain that help neurons to do their job and communicate with one another. So when you're in a bad mood, often we find that it's due to a, a lower levels of serotonin and dopamine than we would like to have. If you take Prozac or Zoloft or any of these SSRIs, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors they're called, it boosts these levels of serotonin in your brain and you start feeling normal again or, or happy. It turns out that music can modulate levels of serotonin and dopamine and a few other interesting chemicals for reasons that we don't understand, but it does do it reliably. Again, it may be tied to evolution. It may be that music was selected by natural selection for its ability to modulate these chemicals. So you put on that song, you might get a jolt of adrenaline, you might get a jolt of dopamine. Those chemicals go to the appropriate parts of the brain to make the neurons fire in a different fashion that improves your mood. What song does that for you? Oh, well, there's a lot of them, but <laughs> one of my favorite groups is uh, Asleep at the Wheel, a Western swing band. <laughs> and uh, just the ch 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 kind of a tempo, and they're writing about boogieing back to Texas or um, uh, the Chattanooga Choo Choo or, you know, these kind of old-timey songs. For me, that always puts me in a good mood. Now, and James Brown. James Brown, of course. Okay, and, and conversely, if, uh, you know, if your woman gone done you wrong and you're really enjoying being in that slew of despond, uh, what's the song you'll put on to really make your, you know, just jump off a balcony kind of music? You know, you raise an interesting point. For me, it might be a Joni Mitchell album, or it might be something by, um, it might be something classical, it might be Mahler. But the idea here is, if you're really feeling depressed, putting on happy music usually doesn't cheer you up. It just makes you feel ticked off. Because <laughs> if you think about it, when you're depressed, you feel kind of, Really, it's about being misunderstood at its core. If you're depressed, you feel that the world is somehow not in sync with you. And the last thing you want is somebody to come marching in with happy music, you know, with a sort of musical slap in the face you ought to be feeling better. What you want is somebody who understands you, and that's the role that sad songs play. And we now think that listening to sad music releases prolactin, the same hormone released when mothers nurse their babies. It's a soothing, tranquilizing hormone that makes you feel better. Hmm. Okay. Uh, but again, to follow up on that question, uh, if you if I mean, there is something inside us that kind of gets off on or enjoys being in a bad mood from time to time. And what's the music you'll well, put on? Well, I would put on Joni Mitchell's Blue album. Uh, I okay. might put on Mahler's Fifth, uh, Miles Davis kind of blue. Hmm. I think what happens in the case of Joni Mitchell is if I'm feeling blue, I feel like I'm at the edge of this precipice at the edge of a cliff, no one understands me, everything is, is really bad. And then Joni starts singing, and I realize, oh, I'm not alone here, she's here with me. And we're feeling the same thing, and she's putting voice into what I'm feeling. She's actually helping me to better understand my feelings. And not only that, but she went through this horrible thing, and now she turned it into a beautiful work of art. It's, it's very inspiring. Hmm. Okay, just finally, given everything that you've said tonight, what would you say is the appropriate adjective for us as a species to apply to the fourth and final movement of Beethoven's Ninth Symphony? The appropriate emotion? Pro the appropriate adjective. How would you describe adjective. that? Well, I would say part of the beauty of music is that it means something different to each of us, and it can mean different things at different times. If I put on Beethoven's Ninth now around Christmas, I might the final movement might make me feel some sense of majesty and ceremony and rega regality. Uh, you put it on at other times, you might feel triumph, you might feel despair. I mean, I think there's no right answer, uh, which is part of the power of Beethoven and part of the power of art in general, is that it can reach us in a very personal way in, and allow us to respond to it in ways that 
complement or amplify what we're feeling at the moment. Now that's fascinating. Do you agree? How, how does it make you feel? Well, I, I must tell you, by the time I've got to the end of that fourth movement of the Ninth Symphony, almost invariably, I'm on the verge of tears. Uh, and that's a consistent emotion time after time after time. But what you've just said is most interesting, which is that our reaction to music can be very much based in uh, time, place, what's happening in our life, and so on, and that the reaction can be very different depending on a whole lot of other external factors. That hadn't occurred to me, actually. Uh, so maybe I'm an anomaly in this. Now, what's the adjective you'd use? I mean, you, you say it moves you to tears. How are you feeling? Are you feeling beauty? Oh, yes. Are you feeling It's just you know. absolutely magnificent. I cannot imagine a more glorious, more spectacular, more emotional, more breathtaking uh, piece of music than that. That does it for me. And the interesting thing, Steve, is that you can't just find that part. You can't isolate the part that causes the tears and then jump right to it. That sense of uh, fulfillment that you get comes partly from the trajectory that Beethoven's taken to get you there. Absolutely right. Absolutely. Yeah, you couldn't put on the last uh, half minute. You've got to hear the whole 40 minute right. wind up to it. Uh, Daniel, yeah. this has been so fascinating. I'm so glad you could join us today. Really grateful uh, for joining us here for Music Week. Uh, appreciate it. And, and yes, let's do this again one more time with you here in the studio next time. That would be even I'd more fun. I'd love to. Thanks for having me. All the best.